electrification of America called Empires of Light, uh, the struggle between Edison and Westinghouse to, as to how we would electrify this country. I would recommend all three of those books, and all three of those books are going to be available to you after the lecture, and I'm sure that Ms. Johns, or Dr. Johns, I should say, she has a Ph.D., in history, uh, Dr. Johns would be happy to sign those books for you. In fact, uh, Dr. Johns got her bachelor's of journalism at Barnard and went on to get her master's degree at the Columbia Journalism School and then her PhD from Johns Hopkins in history. So she's well educated. She writes well on the subject. Her books are among my most favorite books about this period, and I think they would be yours too. Um, please join me in welcoming. Jill Johns to the Flagler Museum or through the Whitehall Lecture Series. So I'm uh, testing the volume. Does this sound okay because I can turn it up or down? Turn it up. Okay. How's that sound? Better. Okay. Uh, well, first of all, I'd like to thank. Um, the Flagler for having me here. I was taken to a very lovely lunch by John and his uh, very nice wife, Rena, and I've now had my first chance to go around this museum, which, I mean, really is magnificent. And um, as someone who spent a lot of time uh, researching and enjoying everything about the Gilded Age, it's really embodied in this amazing uh, museum. And I, of course, I really loved going through the rail car, the private rail car. I always would hear about those, and I've never really seen one that was in mint condition. Um, okay, so oh, today we're going to be uh, telling the story of how the Pennsylvania Railroad came into New York. And um, we'll just start with this. I always like to start with this image because there, it's the only one that I know of that has really uh, the two heroes of this story in the same photo. And one of those is Alexander Cassatt. And if you look at um, the photo, you'll notice that there is a uh, fireplace and it's got sort of the three medallions. And the man who is on the left hand corner of that is Cassatt. Alexander Cassatt, um, he became seventh president of the Pennsylvania Railroad in 1899. And then his right-hand man through this whole huge enterprise of uh, bringing uh, two tunnels under the Hudson River into Manhattan, building Penn Station, which was the fourth largest public building in the world at that time. Uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad had also bought the Long Island Railroad, so those tunnels continued on under Manhattan and became four tunnels that went under the, long, uh, under the East River. Those were the Long Island Railroad tunnels. And um, this was just a huge and epic uh, project that changed forever the ge geography and dynamics of New York City. And the person who then was the right-hand man and saw this through from beginning to end is named Samuel Ray, and he is the furthermost left person on this, and you see him sort of, he's like an outlier. So these are our, our two people, and they are sitting in the boardroom of uh, the Pennsylvania Railroad and in Broad Street Station in uh, Philadelphia on the second floor of this building. So this is the corporate headquarters of the Pennsylvania Railroad, which at this time, in 1899, is, is the most powerful uh, wealthiest corporation in America. And this is very much the age of the railroads which truly transformed this country. Um, and for Cassatt and for Ray, one of their long-standing frustrations was that they could not get their trains into Manhattan. So you're thinking, well, you know, what, what was that like? So let's just pretend that we're going to um, head to New York, and then you might say, well, why did they care that much? Well, New York was the most important city in New York, in, in the United States. It had the, the busiest port in the entire world. It was the financial center of America, uh, Wall Street. It was the cultural center of America, and, and in those days it was also the manufacturing center. And so the great rival for the Pennsylvania Railroad was the Vanderbilt family's New York Central Railroad, and they could bring their passengers into New York in style, though actually many people would have said not such style because that famous remark, the public be damned, came from the Vanderbilt family. 
Um, but their trains came down the Hudson River and into Grand Central Station, not the station that is there today, but nonetheless uh, a station. In contrast, what happened if you took the Pennsylvania Railroad and you were going to New York? So now we'll kind of recreate this as best we can. Okay, so this is Broad Street Station. Those of you who know Philadelphia will recognize a not yet completed uh, Philadelphia City Hall. So you get in the train, you're heading north. It doesn't look so different than today, but this is where you would end up. You would end up at the Jersey City um, Terminal. And you'll notice that there are all of these uh, wagons and so forth. And the Pennsylvania Railroad was by no means the only railroad heading to New York and stopping right there at the edge of the Hudson River. Um, there were 10 railroads that all came to a halt there. Everyone got to New York pretty much on a railroad. And for the bulk of them, what they then had to do was get on a ferry. So if you look to the left here, what you're seeing is a Pennsylvania Railroad ferry. They could accommodate about 1,000 passengers. And on the bottom, there would have been a lot of carts and horses taking things into Manhattan. 40 million people a year took these ferries just for the Pennsylvania Railroad. Now, when I first started working on this book, I felt as if I knew quite a bit about New York history. What I truly had not understood is the extent to which life took place on the water. So if you look at this picture to the right, that is the Hudson River, it's a mile wide, and it was mobbed with vessels. So everything coming down the Erie Canal, all of the barges would get come onto the river and then would have to you know, make their way to various uh, warehouses or grain elevators or ships to head out into the world. All these 10 ferries, uh, uh, 10 railroads had ferries, and those ferries were all plying the waters. Um, there were lots of large ocean liners coming in and out, lots of tugboats, lots of work boats, all kinds of pleasure steamboats. When people, it was hot in uh, Manhattan, you got on the steamboat and, uh, you know, went off to uh, cool off. So this is a very, very busy waterway. And when you got on the Pennsylvania Railroad, uh, ferry boats and turned around, this is what you would see. And I've always assumed this is taken very early in the morning because you'd see, in contrast to the other photo, it's, it's pretty quiet. It was about a 15 to 20 minute ride um, on the ferry into Manhattan. However, these ferry boats were completely captive to the weather. There was no radar, there was no GPS, so the minute it got foggy, they were just groping their way through and there's all these other vessels around it and not infrequently they were having collisions and the ferry boats would go down like stones. Um, and in the winter, when there was a lot of ice in the harbor, I mean, sometimes they literally couldn't get across at all. And this was very, very galling to the Pennsylvania Railroad because they took enormous pride in this the, being what they called the standard railroad of the world, that they gave the highest level of service um, to their passengers. And unlike most of the railroads in America in those days, it was a stockholder-owned enterprise, and they um, always tried to be technologically cutting edge. Whatever they could do for the passenger, the comfort of their passengers, that's what they were trying to do. So this was a very irritating uh, situation to them. Now, the other thing is when you got off of those ferries, what did you encounter? This is what you encountered. You had to get between the ferry boat and this to make it into the rest of Manhattan. This is West Street, and the whole of West, Western Manhattan, where the Hudson River was, is just lined with this kind of chaos because everything was going on to various wharfs and, and ships, and then it was coming off. So uh, this was also unacceptable. And imagine this if the weather is bad, you know, the, the mud, the ugh. So um, this, is, this is what was bedeviling Cassatt and Ray. So let's uh, learn a little bit about Cassatt. He was from a very well-to-do uh, Pennsylvania family. When he's a teenager, the family goes to Europe and he uh, finishes his high school education there in a German high school. He knows, uh, speaks fluent German and French, comes back, uh, gets an engineering degree from uh, Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, finishes in 1859, works briefly in the South, the Civil War begins, and he comes north 
and gets a job with Pennsylvania Railroad, where he begins at the bottom, as does everyone, as a rod and chain man, which is a, basically you're a, a surveyor. And what he really learns about himself and others observe is that he has this tremendous um, capacity for hard work, uh, for detail, and really for um, working with men of every station, which is very important because the railroads uh, are these huge sprawling entities and people are working to every possible level. Um, to put the railroads in perspective, in sort of their place in American history, before the railroads, the biggest corporate enterprises were textile mills. So a typical textile mill of a very large size might have 800, maybe 1,000 employees. It would all be in one place. Now contrast that to what came with the railroads, where they're sprawled out over many, many states. The Pennsylvania Railroad had 150,000 employees. So it was just organizationally a whole other uh, level of difficulties and the Pennsylvania Railroad was very admired for its managerial prowess and became in many ways the model for how corporate America went out about managing itself. So uh, Cassatt is uh, noticed for his abilities and talent and the person who notices him is Tom Scott. You see him in this portrait. He was to become the fourth president of Pennsylvania Railroad and I think this portrait really captures him. He was very buccaneering, he was very charming, he took a lot of risks, um, and he noticed Cassatt. And one of the reasons he noticed Cassatt is because Cassatt was the one who brought to the attention of the railroad the invention of the air brake by George Westinghouse. And I should say that to this day, railroads still use air brakes. Tell you something about how revolutionary that was. Before that, how did railroads stop when they needed to stop? They used brakemen. This is literally a person who leaped from car to car, turning a wheel that slowed down the individual car. And the one-legged or the dead brakeman was a very common feature of American railroads. So to be able to actually stop the trains for the engineer in a, you know, in a very um, sort of organized, mechanical way um, was a big breakthrough. So um, Tom Scott becomes uh, Cassatt's protege. And uh, Cassatt is moving very rapidly up through the ranks. So one of the reasons that the Pennsylvania Railroad is so rich is because it has a monopoly of the city of Pittsburgh, and this is, which at that time was just an absolute uh, manufacturing behemoth. And this is uh, from one of the steel mills. And in the summer of 1877, the country had been on hard times for several years, and uh, Tom Scott gets into a fight with Standard Oil, and I suppose that perhaps Henry Flagler was in there somewhere on that. And uh, Rockefeller informed the railroad he wasn't going to be using their services, which was a big blow. And the way that Tom Scott responded to this was he kept on cutting back on the hours of the men and the pay while demanding more actual productivity from them. So he did this one time too many and there began to be a great strike in the city of Pittsburgh. This is in July of 1877. Cassatt was the only high official of the Pennsylvania Railroad who seemed prepared to actually go to, to uh, Pittsburgh. He did. I would say he made some very bad decisions, and the upshot of it was a huge riot in which everything the Pennsylvania Railroad owned, and remember this is a major hub for them, is destroyed. The mob towards 39 buildings, 104 locomotives, 46 passenger trains, and they had a thousand freight cars there, all filled with freight. Those were all looted, they were all torched, and then sent down the track, and this is what was left. This is a very pivotal moment in Cassatt's life, because he realized that you really have to have a certain level of respect and understanding for what the lives of your employees are. And, um, so, uh, you can imagine the board of the Pennsylvania Railroad was not all that happy with Tom Scott. Um, his presidency came to an end soon thereafter. And in his uh, stead, uh, the new president was the man to the right, George Roberts. And I think, again, these uh, images say it all. George Roberts was a much more prudent man. And uh, the other thing I should say about Tom Scott is that uh, the 
retirement age for Pennsylvania Railroad president was 70, and he was far younger than that. But shortly after he lost his job, he died. And the pen, the, being the president of Pennsylvania Railroad was considered a killing job. So George Roberts takes over, and um, Cassatt is disappointed because he actually had risen high enough that he himself was by now a vice president, and uh, he had hoped that he would be the president. One suspects he was uh, too close to Tom Scott to uh, get that reward. So here you have a picture of Cassatt uh, to the right, and what I haven't mentioned is that his sister is the now very famous artist Mary Cassatt, and this is a portrait by her of him, and to the left is their mother. So in 1881, after um, George Roberts has become president, his mother writes him a letter and says, how do you manage with Roberts as chief? I think you didn't like the idea of serving under him. Please don't put off resigning too long. Remember the fate of your predecessor. And what she's alluding to is the fact that people who have these high-level jobs at the Pennsylvania Railroad um, often do not have longevity in their own lives. So, in fact, Cassatt did resign the next year. Um, he was all of 42, and um, he was a millionaire many times over. Aside from working at the railroad, he had a, a number of other interests, and he was, I think we can say the man was a genius. He was a genius of the world of railroads, which he had completely mastered. And again, remember, this is a very complicated world that's really sort of inventing itself as it's going along. And while he was uh, at this high position there, he standardized their rails, their locomotives. Um, he was the one who uh, arranged the means for the uh, railroad to get up to New York, and he organized this whole system of ferries that he now found intolerable. In his other life, his private life, he was really a gentleman farmer, and you see him here in um, his estate up on the main line, Cheswold, where he was... Um, president of the Radnor Hunt, he was president of the uh, Marion Cricket Club, he was a great collector of paintings thanks to his sister, and he was a man with a sense of humor. He had this group called the, the Farmers Club and they would have these dinners and the utensils were all little um, rakes and hoes and then they would also have chickens and ducks that would kind of be wandering around on the floor. He was very passionate about horses and uh, you see him here with the, this particular kind of horses that he liked to uh, four in hand, I believe they were called. And once he was retired, the other thing he did is he bought uh, a big farm called Chesterbrook and he began uh, breeding racehorses and running them, which I guess was considered a bit risque because he never ran them in his own name. He had a, a pseudonym. So that's Alexander Cassatt, Samuel Ray. Very, very different story. Uh, born into humble circumstances in Hollidaysburg. His father dies when he's 13. He goes to work on a farm. But what he really aspires to do is to work on the railroad. The railroad is the great enterprise of um, you know, the late 19th century, mid-19th century in America. And any uh, person of ambition, a young man of ambition, that's where he wanted to be. The way today... Any young person of ambition is probably trying to figure out how to make their fortune, you know, on the Internet or the next Google. So he also starts as a rod and chain man, and that's what you see him doing here. Um, he, unlike Cassatt, really does not have a powerful mentor, but he rises enough that he makes it to uh, corporate headquarters in Philadelphia, where in 1889, at age 34, he feels as if he's not really going anywhere, and so he quits and goes to work for one of their rivals, uh, the B&O Railroad, uh, down in Baltimore. And this is their very beautiful headquarters building, which sadly uh, disappeared in the fire of 1904. So while he is there, what he does is he helps to create um, a belt railway that involves a, a tunnel under um, a body of water, and for which they develop these um, little electric locomotives. After a couple of years, he's not in good health, and he resigns, and he is very surprised to be contacted by George Roberts, President of Pennsylvania Railroad, saying, would he come back once he had uh, sort of recovered enough from uh, whatever was ailing him? And so he did. He went back. Now, I should say that all of these years that Cassatt has remained on the board of the Pennsylvania Railroad, where one of his tasks is to figure out how do we get our railroad into Manhattan. And Samuel Ray, when he returns, um, 
begins to work on this with Cassatt. And uh, these are interrupted in, the, in 1893. There's a, a, the terrible panic of 1893, so, you know, sort of doing anything gets shelved. But um, things begin to come back, and George Roberts does not reach age 70. He dies as president of the Pennsylvania Railroad, and a, yet a new man comes on, and you see him here in the middle, Frank Thomas, with this absolutely wonderful mustache. And by the time Thomas comes on, it's uh, 1897, McKinley is president, and what's known as the McKinley boom is in full, full throttle. The economy is just in such prosperity, the Pennsylvania Railroad cannot begin to keep up or give proper service to its freight customers. And people are very, very unhappy. Um, they're having to wait a very long time for things to show up. There's just not enough cars. There's not enough rails. It's just a crushing time. And Thomas lasts two years, and he, too, is dead. So this brings us back to Alexander Cassatt. He is now 60 years old. He spent 17, 18 years in a very pleasant retirement. Now, it's true he has various business interests, but he has a yacht. He goes to Europe all the time. He has all these racehorses. Um, you know, he has a very good life. And he's been on the board with all of these men. They know him well. And they come to him and ask him if he would consider being president. It's a very dire time for this railroad that takes great pride in being, giving the best of service. They are not giving the best of service. And he says to them that he would come on the condition that he basically have dictatorial powers, that they had to engage in a uh, massive, uh, swift expansion, which would cost vast amounts of money. And remember, this is the board of the Pennsylvania Railroad. They're always very prudent and conservative. And he's sort of talking like a wild man. Um, but he is also considered to be still, because he's still very involved in the railroad world, really, you know, one of the geniuses of this world. And so the board, they back off at first and they take some time to think about it, but in the end, they, they bring him on as president. And so, of course, what is the first big issue? We're standing in Manhattan someplace and we're looking across the Hudson River at the Pennsylvania Railroad Ferry House and Cassatt and Ray are once again asking, how do we get our uh, trains in here? So one thought is that there had been built and never finished under the Hudson River a trolley tunnel, and it had uh, moved forward in fits and starts with some terrible loss of life, and finally it had been concluded that this was not a technically, technologically feasible project. Um, you could not actually get, uh, in the end, you couldn't put a tunnel under the Hudson River. The, the Hudson River riverbed was incredibly silty, very soupy, soft stuff, and it made it very hard to build a tunnel because you kept on having all of the air that was in the tunnel so the workmen could work, escape up through this very silty riverbed. Um, so in the end, many people had died and the tunnel was, was never finished. Also, even if you could manage to finish the tunnel, it was still a trolley tunnel, which meant everyone would have to get off at, you know, the, the ferry house, slog all their stuff into the trolleys, go through uh, under the Hudson River, and where would they end up? So that seemed like, you know, not such a great solution. So what they hit upon was another, you know, big, huge, visionary project that had been bouncing around for a long time, which was the North River Bridge. And I should say that the Hudson River and the North River are the same river. A little confusing, but that's the way it was. So by the time this project in 1901 is like coming into full possibility. It's become Triple Decker Bridge. It would be the largest bridge in the world. It would have cost $100 million, and it was federally chartered. So all of those 10 railroads that stopped at the um, riverside would have had access to this bridge. And as Cassatt and Ray began to, uh, you know, kind of coalesce around this as the solution of how to get their trains in, um, the other railroads, as they approached them, their thinking was, well, we all know that the Pennsylvania Railroad is very rich, we know they're very powerful, and we know they're desperate to get into Manhattan and have been for years. So we're pretty sure they'll build this whether we pony up anything or not. So uh, we'll just let them build it, and then we'll have access. And so that's where things were in 1901 in the summer, and Cassatt was just crushed because he just felt that he could not ask his stockholders to 
to put up that kind of money for the benefit of other railroads as well. So to, you know, kind of uh, ease the pain of this, he decided to go to Europe and visit his sister, Mary Cassatt. See, she was quite the fashion plate. And while he was there, he gets a cable from uh, Samuel Ray saying, go look at the Gare d'Orsay, which had been completed the year before for the uh, Paris Exposition of 1900, because they have these uh, tunnels that come in along the river, and they use electric um, locomotives to get these trains in. Now, I should say that Cassatt was a person who knew railroads from top to bottom because he had worked in every possible job, and he often actually himself served as an engineer on the train. So if he was going someplace, he would go in and, and uh, run the train himself. Um, he spent three days examining every detail of this setup and realized this is the answer. And he immediately cut his vacation short. He went to London and picked up Charles Jacobs, who was considered the premier subaqueous tunnel engineer of his day. And he had actually built a subaqueous tunnel under the East River for a gas main um, in New York. And he'd also done some tunneling, I believe, under the, the uh, Thames River. So in great secrecy, the two of them returned to New York. And the thing that Cassatt realized is that if they were going to do this, it would mean that no one could use these tunnels but them. So they would have this big leg up. Um, and then the other thing is that it would be this tremendously political undertaking because they would need all kinds of permissions. And um, who would those political people be? Well, on the left is boss William Croker. And when I was researching my book, so he was the, the head of Tammany, the Democratic machine in New York. I actually almost couldn't believe this could be true, what I was reading. It was very much true. Um, so he was just a, a thug who uh, turned out to have a great talent for politics and rose to be boss of Tammany, became enormously rich on graft, or what was called boodle, and he then took this money and moved to England, where he set himself up as like a pseudo-English lord with a huge estate known as Wantage, where he bred horses, and he kept a lot of pigs that he um, named after New York politicians. Now, this was not in his retirement. He was the active boss of Tammany, and he ran Tammany via the telegram. And when there were problems or issues, like if there was an election or a scandal, he would go back to New York and deal with it. But the rest of the time he lived in England. And he was known in the New York papers as the Baron of Wantage because that was where his estate, the name of his estate. So, um, Boss Croker. And uh, Tammany Hall controlled uh, the Board of Aldermen. And uh, it was known that if you wanted to do anything in New York, you would have to pay significant bribes. So that was that reality. The person to the right is uh, boss William Collier Platt, and he was the Republican boss of New York State, and he lived to serve the corporations, so he would be their friend. Um, the only reason we remember Platt at all today is we are beholden to him for uh, Teddy Roosevelt. Now, why is that? When he was boss, um, there was a terrible scandal, and their gubernatorial uh, well, the governor, who was Republican, uh, was not going to run again, and they had to put up someone who could potentially win this despite this uh, unpleasant scandal. And the only real prospect was Teddy Roosevelt. Platt loathed Roosevelt. He loathed reformers. But Roosevelt was the only person who had a possibility of retaining the governorship for the Republicans. So Platt held his nose and put Teddy up, and he won. Well, as soon as Roosevelt was governor, then the next thing Platt had to figure out was how to shove him out of the state. And the way he did that was making him vice president. <laughs> so you can imagine how Platt felt when McKinley was assassinated. And that had happened exactly as Cassatt and Jacobs were on the, the boat coming back. So as they got off the boat, uh, you know, full of their plans for these tunnels, uh, Teddy Roosevelt is just becoming president. So uh, this is the kind of the political scene as, as they come off. So what happens now is that Jacobs goes out at night, you know, in the dead of night on these Pennsylvania Railroad tugs and is very secretly doing a very thorough series of tests on what exactly is down in the riverbed um, in the Hudson River. 
can they build a tunnel through this? So the good news for Cassatt is that Jacobs comes back and says, yes, we can build two tunnels through this, tunnels big enough to accommodate your 700-ton trains. Now, of course, the Pennsylvania Railroad will have to develop electric engines that are strong enough to pull these because, of course, you can't use steam engines uh, or everyone would asphyxiate before they got to the other side. The bad news is, and if you look at this bottom here, you'll see what the gradients are, Cassatt thought his plan was to build Penn Station on a bunch of sort of derelict rail yards that were fairly close to the river. Well, what he found out from Charles Jacobs is, no, they weren't going to be able to do this. These Penn Station would have to be in the middle of what was known as the Tenderloin, Manhattan's worst vice district, 100 whorehouses, opium dens, uh, very tough saloons, a lot of gambling salons. This is really the, where the criminal classes truly rule in Manhattan. And uh, this is where they have to acquire 28 acres and 700 buildings to build their train station. So this is not good news, but they then get some further stroke of luck, which is that Tammany has overreached itself, which it did from time to time, um, by fixing the price of ice, which is absolutely crucial to the lives of especially the poor. This is in the era before refrigeration, and they had uh, jacked up the price. Uh, they doubled it. Well, then William Randolph Hearst had his new muckraking papers, and it soon emerged on the front pages that the price of ice was double because of Tammany. So the usual Tammany voters uh, rebelled, they turned their backs, and they elected a reformer, this man, Seth Lowe. Seth Lowe uh, had resigned as president of Columbia University, and he had been, when Brooklyn was still a city, uh, mayor of Brooklyn. Mayor of Brooklyn when the Brooklyn Bridge was built. When the Brooklyn Bridge was built, they made their peace with Tammany by allowing uh, their influence on the bridge and by paying $65,000 in bribes. So, uh, Cassatt, who I, there are very few photos of Cassatt, but you see him here. Um, and one thing I have not mentioned about him is that he was a, um, quite a clothes horse and that uh, when he was coming up through the ranks and would get dispatched to his uh, next uh, work assignment, when he would arrive, uh, you know, the workers would look at him with great skepticism because he was such a dandy. But um, they would find very quickly that in a day or two, he could master everything that it had taken them a year. So he would really quickly earn their respect. Now, my other favorite thing about this photo, aside from it just sort of shows Cassatt in his element, is that to the left, you see this little figure? I mean, he really looks straight off the Monopoly board. You know, the, the capitalist, the old-fashioned capitalist, anyway, so that's great. So Cassatt comes to, to Seth Lowe because, I mean, essentially the, the Pennsylvania Railroad is proposing to transform the city of New York by building these 16 miles of tunnels. They're going to start in the Meadowlands, build tunnels through the Bergen Hills, come down under the Hudson River uh, into Penn Station, which will be 50, the trains will come in 50 feet below street level because that's what they have to do continue on through Manhattan, the four tunnels will go under the East River and open up Long Island. So this is going to be truly a, re you know, just utterly change the whole experience of New York. It's going to connect it to the mainland. Um, this is a huge deal, and it's going to cost $100 million. It will take 10 years, and it will provide thousands and thousands of jobs over this whole period of time. And Cassatt's feeling is he is not going to pay a dime to anyone, as in Tammany, to do this. Tammany had made it known that they thought that the proper sum would be $300,000. So uh, there then ensues a year-long major political battle as Tammany tries to force the Pennsylvania Railroad to ante up, and the Pennsylvania Railroad and Seth Lowe are very uh, locked in this determination not to do that. And as you see, uh, eventually they succeed. The, t the tiger is the symbol of Tammany, 
and uh, finally public opinion was such that even Tammany could no longer hold out. Now there were concessions made, one has to say. Some of the construction companies uh, that worked on this project were certainly owned by Tammany Sachems, as they were known. So they didn't pay any bribes, but they uh, assuaged people in other ways. So the, this whole project uh, now starts to get going. And what I haven't mentioned, um, and it's just sort of a little fun fact, is that the, the person who oversaw all of the acquisition of real estate was a, a man named Douglas Robinson, a very uh, sort of tough and well-respected commercial uh, realtor. He also happened to be Teddy Roosevelt's brother-in-law. I mean, it wasn't, you know, it wasn't, that had no bearing on this really, but it's just sort of an interesting fact. Um, so they're all, they're starting to take down all these buildings. And you see the scale of this, and you might say, so why is this building still here? It's a bar. The men need to get a drink. So Cassatt is now assembling his team. This is uh, the Board of Engineers. Uh, the man uh, in from the right, second in from the right is Charles Jacobs. You always recognize him by this big uh, handlebar mustache. Every one of these people you see here is in charge of a different section of this vast enterprise, all of which are going forward simultaneously. Charles McKim is engaged to uh, design the station. They're starting to clear the station and um, they have to, as I say, excavate down 50 feet. And so they have, these trains you see here were the locomotives that operated on the New York elevators. They, the companies were obliged to switch to electric trains because you can imagine, you know, steam engines up high above the street. I mean, they're sending down sparks and all kinds of terrible things on people below. So the Pennsylvania Railroad bought these and they then constructed their own uh, elevated railroad that took all the fill and to the Hudson River and dumped it into these ever waiting barges. So this was this just incredible enterprise in the middle of this busy city. And it, uh, the Panama Canal was being built at the same time and this was re referred to as the Culebra Cut of Manhattan. And you see they're propping up all these things. They're propping up streets, they're propping up water pipes, they're propping up the elevated, all while they're doing this non-stop blasting day and night. And it's this incredible spectacle and you see all these people watching it. So at the same time, they are now starting on six tunnels. And each of those, what you see here is the, the whitehead shield, and that's what they're using to actually dig the tunnels. And the, the, are these little doorways that you see, and depending on what kinds of materials they were going through, either they had workers that were in front of these little doorways chopping stuff, or they were pushing the uh, greathead shield forward and this like soup, sort of soupy silt was coming through it. Um, and they had one of these at the end of each of these prospective six tunnels, and each of the tunnels would then have to meet up under the riverbed um, halfway. So they had to be absolutely perfectly uh, positioned so they could align in an airtight way under the middle of the river. And when the Whitehead, the Greathead Shield would move forward, it will always move, 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 be shoved two feet and six inches, and you see these ribs that are going in. Each one of them is exactly that, and they're 13 pieces, and they would all get um, riveted into place. And what you're also seeing here is the aligning team, because as I, you know, to make sure that these tunnels meet up, the alignment has to be perfect. So a huge amount of what went on was the aligning. So. In order to work in these tunnels, they were full of compressed air, so everyone went in and out via airlocks. And the, the actual, um, not the aligning teams, but the actual workers who were, you know, doing the shoving and taking all the muck out, and there were um, mules down there that helped to take all this stuff out. They were known as tunnel mules. Those people were known as sandhogs. And it was, could be very dangerous work, not so much on the, under the Hudson River, but under the East River many men died from the bends and just the consequences of, of working in this compressed air. So about the time that they were uh, doing their tunnels, there was a terrible, terrible accident in the tunnels that went into uh, the Vanderbilt's New York Central Station. A train was coming into the tunnels. It wasn't aware that there was a train in front of it, and it just rammed full bore into that train. There was The trains all telescoped. It was just carnage in this pitch black tunnel. 
So Cassatt's reaction to that was to design what you see here, a way that if there was ever an accident in their tunnels, there could be no telescoping. Now, many people are surprised to learn, uh, one, these tunnels still exist, and they're the Amtrak tunnels. So people always go, oh, but you know, tunnels don't go away. <laughs> and when you're in those trains going into Manhattan now and you look out them, you still see these uh, sidewalks. And the other part of it was that if there were some kind of problem and the train stopped, people could get out on these sidewalks and walk to safety out of the tunnels. So again, you know, because that was always, you know, he's a real detail man. All kinds of things happened in the course of uh, working on these tunnels. Um, here they were working under the Erie Yards on the New Jersey side, created this huge sinkhole, ate up all these trains. Uh, you know, they would just laugh these things off and, you know, on they went. So uh, what you see here is a picture of um, Charles Jacobs, again, recognizable with his walrus mustache and it's the first of the tunnels they have met up. And uh, Jacobs used to say that Henry Hudson was the first white man to go across the Hudson River, that he was the first white man to walk across the Hudson River. Now, um, meanwhile, you know, everything here is going forward. You see it's getting deeper. This is a John Singer Sargent portrait of Cassatt that was, you know, done for the boardroom. Now, he is not present as they go through this tunnel walk um, in uh, September of 1906. And the reason is that the previous summer he'd been up at his cottage, uh, cottage in Bar Harbor, and um, his grandchildren were there and had whooping cough, and he himself uh, became ill. And he was um, never, you know, really quite so well, not well enough to go on this uh, tunnel walk. And then, this is uh, his mansion on Rittenhouse Square, right after Christmas in 1906, he died. It was a huge shock. People were very, very not expecting this. It was front page news all over America. And when uh, Samuel Ray happened to be in Pittsburgh and he found out about it, um, he sent this telegraph to uh, Cassatt's widow, Lois. And I've always found this very touching because these are two men from such very different backgrounds, and they were now working and had been working hand in hand on this very difficult project um, for a number of years. And the telegram read, the sudden passing away of Mr. Cassatt has shocked me beyond expression. I had often promised to have the New York extension done before he reached the retirement age. Cassatt was 67 when he died. But it was not to be. He was an extraordinary man, one so noble and inspiring. I have never had so much pleasure in my life as my seven years of association with him. So, I mean, it was a very, um, you know, touching relationship. They, they were working together at a level of detail that seemed extraordinary to me as I went through the Pennsylvania archives, um, you know, looking at the phone messages, every single building. That was, built, that was bought uh, in the Tenderloin, both Ray and Cassatt were aware of it and discussed the prices. Again, sort of the, the minutia of it, it seems surprising to me that, that they were part of that. Um, so the, the new president of the Pennsylvania Railroad is a man named James McRae, and really his experience had to do with Pittsburgh and the, what were known as the Lions West. He really knew nothing about New York. So from here on in, Samuel Ray is really solely in charge of this very complicated, very difficult, plagued with a lot of problems, which I don't really have time to go into here, um, but all on his shoulders. But meanwhile, everything's moving forward. You see the station is coming up. This is 1908. And again, you sort of have to put your back in this time and place. This is a terrible neighborhood. And all of a sudden, this Roman temple is materializing. And uh, it's this very sort of pink, rosy stone, very beautiful. Um, it must have been sort of surreal. And as things are getting finished, uh, they have all these uh, sort of jolly celebratory dinners. They take place at Delmonico's. They involve a lot of champagne toasting and sort of silly songs that have all kinds of lyrics having to do with tunnels. Uh, once again, you can uh, see that Charles Jacobs is presiding here. 
and Samuel Ray is, uh, you know, sort of really come into his own. And um, one of the things I learned when I was working on this book, which was really not known because it was nowhere in print, um, is that his son went to Princeton, majored in engineering, came out and came to work in this vast project as a junior engineer and was working in the tunnels and somewhere along the line uh, became ill and he died. When I say that many people died working in these tunnels, I mean most times it was very direct, but in this case um, we don't know exactly what happened because I, I never was able to find anything except that someone told me about this and uh, helped me get in touch with Cassatt's descendants who said that yes, uh, that was exactly what had happened. He was his only son. Uh, you see he died on April 8, 1908, and uh, he's actually buried in the same graveyard as Cassatt at uh, Church of the Redeemer in Bryn Mawr on the brain, uh, main line in, um, outside of Philadelphia. Very, you know, very tragic. But, you know, the project went on, and you can see here it, in all its monumentality, uh, a lot of very beautiful statuary, huge attention, you know, to detail and magnificence. This is one of the famous clocks on each side um, is a statue, one of night, one of day. And this is the very famous um, general waiting room, and it's all sort of modeled on the baths of Caracalla. And Samuel Ray thought this was so magnificent, it was way too good for anyone to sit in. So there were no chairs or benches allowed in the waiting room. Those all went elsewhere. Um, the other thing he was very determined about was that there would be a statue honoring um, Alexander Cassatt in a place in the station where he could overlook the waiting room. And so uh, he was responsible for making sure that this uh, was in place. Now, the other person... Um, who did not live to see the opening of the station was Charles McKim. In September of uh, 1909, his um, dear old friend and longtime partner, uh, Stanford White, was murdered, and it was the ensuing scandal and trial and what have you, uh, you know, turned out he was deeply bankrupt. It was just so heartbreaking for McKim, uh, literally his heart broke, and he... Uh, did not survive. So the station opens in uh, November of 1910, and you see here um, an electric locomotive. <laughs> it doesn't look like much, but it's what got them in and out. And, I mean, people just were uh, astonished when the station opened. It was such a, a marvel, such a monument, uh, like nothing people had seen. And... Um, so James McRae did not reach retirement age. Um, in uh, 1912, he died, and uh, it was now the turn of Samuel Ray to become president of the Pennsylvania Railroad. And as president, uh, he oversaw the last uh, part. Oh, I should say, so when he became president, he had to get a new house. Uh, where he lived was not, was not adequate. So he built this very beautiful estate, Waverly, um, which still exists and is a very nice retirement home, where I should say I gave this talk once and got to go and see his house, which was really, uh, I, I was very moved by it because I had great affection for Samuel Ray. Um, anyway, so uh, as president, he oversaw the... Uh, building and completion of the Hellgate Bridge. So not, one, not only could you get out to Long Island now, but you kept going on a Pennsylvania Railroad train. You could go across the Hellgate Bridge and then up to New England. And uh, this was dedicated uh, by Samuel Ray in 1917. So this is a project that really began in 1899 and took, I mean, for all practical purposes, you could say it took almost two decades. Um, well, as we all know, uh, railroads did not fare well in the age of cars and uh, airplanes. And so after World War II, the Pennsylvania Railroad really fell on hard times and became rather desperate. And they decided to sell off the air rights above Penn Station and allow it to be torn down. Um, and I should say that uh, Samuel Ray did reach retirement age. <laughs> he retired at age 70 
in great glory and uh, lived another four years uh, doing what he liked to do. He uh, had a peach orchard. He was still very involved in financial activities. He was a great collector of old uh, English silver and he was a great reader of history and biography and uh, after he retired this statue was put across the uh, walkway from where Alexander Cassatz was. But in any case, uh, both of them would have been very sad to see that uh, their successors uh, planned to tear down their monument to the ages, Penn Station. And um, I was uh, just saying earlier to Mr. Blades that I was, had seen this image a number of times, and honestly, almost no one cared that Penn Station was going to be torn down. You know, you might see a picture like this and think, oh, you know, big demonstrations. This was literally just a handful of architects. Um, Penn Station had become extremely run down, and contrary to the expectations of the Pennsylvania Railroad when they built it, there was a Long Island Railroad station also in Penn Station to serve the commuters of Long Island. And that became really the most heavily used aspect of the station. And those people never, ever saw the McKim part of the station. They really, you know, came into this terrible cramped area and, you know, kind of went right out onto the street. So I have met many people who said, well, you know, I always ran, uh, rode the Long Island Railroad and I didn't care at all when they tore down the station because they didn't experience the station. They just had all the, you know, this cramped feeling. Um, and the station itself, even if you were using it as a railroad passenger, it was very dingy, the, uh, these you know, beautiful skylights had all become covered uh, with soot and you know, lots of broken glass uh, uh, up on the top. So it was a, a, you know, a really crummy place. So they, uh, they tore it down. It took them three years, 1963 to 1966. And as they did, they dumped a lot of it in the Meadowlands. I mean, this is just heartbreaking. It looks like a Roman ruin. And what you see here is the Statue of Day, one of the many of these statues and uh, bits and pieces of sculpture were salvaged, but no organized you know, effort was made. And you can tell this is the Statue of Day because there is a sunflower on each side of her face. And in the background, what you're seeing there is a Pennsylvania Railroad uh, train. Um, so that is the very sad tale of, you know, this extraordinary uh, epic of engineering. And I, one of the things that was odd to me when I was working on this was um, how it was so little ever mentioned that, that this was the biggest engineering project of its time. And the reason was because the Pennsylvania Railroad stockholders hated this project. And whenever there was any mention of it, the stock would fall more. They didn't see why ferries weren't good enough, <laughs> you know. So, um, very quickly, as many of you may know, there was proposed, a, you know, a subsequent uh, follow-up to this, which was, uh, you know, more tunnels under the Hudson River. They were then um, canceled by Governor Christie as, you know, just not in keeping with the austerity of our times. So, um, that's the next lecture coming up, and I thank you very much, and uh, I see, I see uh, John is coming, and so we'll... Thank you.